formal process. Nothing personal. Word of the day for Wednesday, August 24th, 2022 is formal process. I like that because some processes are not formal. Like, hey, where are we going tomorrow? Oh, I don't know. How are we going to get there? I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll Uber. We'll drive. But a formal process means we have a driver coming or we have an Uber that we've chosen the exact time. I like it when teams say we're undergoing a formal review. When they have a major scandal, they say it's going to be very formal. We're going to figure out who's going to be helpful to us, who's not, how we're going to solve our issues. When you sell a team, you don't undergo a formal process. It is a process to sell your team. Artie Moreno came out yesterday with the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, the greatest underperforming team in the history of baseball. Hyperbole? I think not. When you've got Trout, you've got Otani, they spend money even though everyone's saying they don't spend enough. That's a bunch of absolute malarkey. They spend plenty to have won and they've won nothing. As I remind you, Mike Trout has not won a playoff game, zero, in his entire career. Shohei Otani has not been in a playoff game, zero, in his entire career. So out of nowhere, after all of the Nothing Personal episodes talking about the Angels, talking about how absolutely terrible they are, talking about how Artie Moreno is not just one of the least popular owners, for sure, but in addition, he is uh, the number one meddling owner right when people when they're hiring gms gms don't even want to work there and there's only 30 jobs that's how bad it is because unlike jerry jones who says he's the gm artie moreno's the gm he's the president he's the head of marketing he's the head of sales he's the head of development trying to get a new stadium trying to do that funny land deal remember we talked about that my god we've talked about artie moreno a lot but yesterday here it comes the angels have announced and initiated a formal process to evaluate, hold on, this is a mouthful, strategic alternatives, including a possible sale of the team. Come on. Why not put out a press release? Hi, I'm Artie. We're selling. I've got estate planning issues. We talked about it yesterday. I got estate planning issues. We're losing too much money. I can't get a stadium built. The government agencies where I gave money to that I shouldn't have, we all got caught, so I can't get the land. Nothing's working out for me. I'll never catch the Dodgers. We can't win. Do I trade Otani? Trout is hurt. What am I going to do? Ha! Huh. I'm going to initiate a formal process to explore and evaluate strategic alternatives. Here's how this works. There's no evaluating strategic alternatives. In the business world on Wall Street, you can absolutely evaluate strategic alternatives. And here's what that means. There's something where you can have a merger. You can do an acquisition. A merger is where you find a company and say, ooh, why don't we combine? An acquisition, hey, why don't we buy that company and see if there's economies of scale? It would be like the angels evaluating, should we buy the Dodgers and combine them to one Los Angeles team? Or maybe we should merge with the Dodgers, that would be combining. We could buy the Dodgers and just, that's one, hey, buy, I mean, Coca, we totally got it wrong. That is one of the strategic alternatives. You buy the Dodgers and you contract them and then you own LA. Ugh, of course they're gonna evaluate that as an alternative. That makes total sense. <laughs> no, in baseball, there's only one thing that happens when you hire an investment bank or who did they hire? They hired a good guy actually, Sal Galatioto. Galatioto. I know him and I've never pronounced his last name before. There's a group of people, you know how Coke and I do the investigations into front offices when the commissioners hire us and we just say, oh yeah, there were, there were problems, but everything's okay, everything's fine. Remember that? So there's a group, a very small group of people. Steve Greenberg is probably the number one he is, uh, he is part of Allen and Company. They're these companies that get hired and basically what they do is nothing. Sorry guys, you know I love you, but I didn't hire you to sell the team, to buy the Marlins, to sell the Expos. Why? Because we didn't need to. Because once you stand on a mountaintop and say, hey, we're one of 30 teams and we are for sale, they're gonna come to you. It's not like they're gonna identify. When you hire 
a bank to help you. You're hiring them so they can actually help you identify potential targets, potential acquisition targets, potential companies who will buy your company, individuals who may nobody's heard of. When a baseball team's for sale, they come running to you. So Artie Moreno puts in a release. The Angels had a release when Jeffrey told me to sell the Marlins, we didn't do a release. I leaked it out to the media. I answered a few questions when I had to, and then I started taking phone calls. It's not like splitting the atom. But they released something that said, Moreno family explores possible sale of team. Horse hockey, they're not exploring that, they're selling the team. So now they put their finances together and they get all the documents, they get all the player contracts together, they get all the sponsorship contracts together, their TV deals and everything else. They put it in one sort of electronic data room like the Washington Nationals are doing right now. And then you find out who's willing to buy your team. You have a price in your mind of what you wanna sell it for. And then people start looking at your books and none of it matters. Nobody bids on a team according to what the numbers are in that famous document room. We've, we've read about it like with the Washington Nationals. There are these different groups who go into the virtual document room. It didn't, wasn't virtual in the beginning. It was actually a room like the size of a room I'm in right now. If you see the background, it's a slightly different background. If you're on Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel, I'm here in Lebetard studio at the Clevelander. You literally would have a room this size, there'd be paper stacked, they'd be in file files and they'd be labeled. Now it's just all electronic. So Artie Moreno, for whatever reason, put a quote in his release, a quote in the release saying you're gonna sell the team. It's been a great honor and privilege to own the Angels for 20 seasons. He bought the team the year we won the World Series. As an organization, here it goes. What do you do when you haven't won a World Series or a playoff game? What do you focus on? Get ready. We have worked to provide our fans an affordable and family-friendly ballpark experience while fielding competitive lineups, which included some of the game's all-time greatest players. Hey, sometimes you have to make chicken salad out of chicken shit, right? And that's exactly what Artie Moreno's doing in this quote. That is not, A, it's not necessary to put a quote. Just say, hey, we're selling the team, so come and get it. This team is worth $4 billion. But he didn't stop there. This is an ego, the likes of which you only find in 30 places. Although this difficult decision was entirely our choice. <laughs> okay, Coca, when, when, you, uh, when you're having an argument with someone, and then your friend comes up to you and says, oh, how come you're going away for the weekend to that bed and breakfast? And you say, oh, it was entirely my choice. Or when you're at a restaurant, like Ben Stiller and along came Polly eating Indian food and schwitzing through your shirt and then spending time clogging your toilet. Oh, that was entirely my choice. The only time you say it's entirely your choice is when it was not entirely your choice. So did baseball force Artie Moreno to sell? No. But people thought that was a possibility because of the reputation of Artie. So his ego said, we've got to put in the release that it was entirely our choice. Not necessary. But then he said, not only was it our choice, it deserved a great deal of thoughtful consideration. <laughs> I can't even. This is the biggest load of crap maybe I've ever seen in a release. And that is saying something. So how does it work? What's gonna happen? Well, I got a few thoughts for you. Forbes valued the team at $2.2 .2 billion in their most recent list, which they do before the season starts. And I've told you that Forbes, they have no idea what they're talking about. They have no information. They have no access to any documents. The only Forbes valuation they've ever gotten right was this year they valued with the NFL. And I told you about this yesterday. It's funny how these shows were perfect consecutively. The the Broncos are valued at 4.65. Way to go, Forbes. You got that one right. So the Angels 2.2. So you think Artie Moreno said to his bankers, hey, let's just charge 2.2. That's what we're worth. If we get 2.15, that'd be okay. No, no. The Anaheim Angels of Los Angeles are going to get more than $2.2 .2 billion. I'll even make it an official wait to see. Wait to see when I tell you something's gonna happen. 
It either happens or it doesn't, but we'll revisit it. The Angels will sell for more than $2.2 billion, and this sale will get done. Now, the Nationals have dragged on. This sale will get done before the start of next season, and that is a very fast timeline because right now it's August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April. We have eight months. That's it. I'm totally distracted by something, and I need to just tell you, eight months until next season starts, and the season doesn't end yet for another two months. So the entire off season, if you don't make the playoffs, is October, November, December, January. You have four months until spring training starts, and players would come in, right, when they're off steroids and they lost all the weight because they got the guaranteed contract. Oh, I did a very major diet this off season. It's four months. Give me a break. All right, so what are the Angels going to do now with Shohei Otani? That is the talk of baseball. Does this mean Otani's going to sign? Does it mean they're going to trade him the way the Nationals traded Juan Soto? I didn't think the Nationals would trade Juan Soto unless someone hit the bid and the new owners, all of the new potential owners, approved the trading of Juan Soto. They got a huge, huge amount of prospects from the San Diego Padres. They took some money off the books for this year and next year. The potential owners in Washington said, we're good, we're going to rebuild, we're going to move on. Artie Moreno is behind because he has not yet identified who's going to buy the Anaheim Angels. And as soon as Artie sells, by the way, I will call it the Los Angeles Angels because that's the name of the team. Someone tweeted at me or, or DM'd me or texted me saying, are they going to change the name from that awkward name, the Anaheim Angels of Los Angeles in Anaheim? I do that just for fun. The actual name of the team, it was the California Angels, then the Anaheim Angels, then the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, and now already made it just the Los Angeles Angels. So that's sort of that. So Shohei Otani. They're not going to sign him to a long-term deal. They're not going to trade him without speaking to the next set of potential owners. It's the same thing as Juan Soto. The only slight difference is that what happens if in that digital document room, there's one piece of paper hidden behind the number of toilets on the club level, right over the number of hot dogs sold on an average Tuesday game, a single piece of paper that says, we have already agreed to give Shohei Otani an average of the top three deals in Major League Baseball, and we made that agreement when we signed him several years ago from Japan. <gasps> Is it possible that you can have any sort of side agreement and not disclose it? No, because a purchase agreement has what's called a representation and a warranty. A representation and a warranty is when you as a seller are saying, we've told you everything, we've shown you everything, and we are not responsible for anything else other than, other than what you see in this virtual document room. Anything I may have said to you, forget. Anything you may have heard, forget. If it's not in this document room, it doesn't exist period. And if something does exist, I'm representing to you that I told you everything. I'm giving you a warranty, like a warranty on your house or your car, that everything I said is true and there's nothing left. However, if you discover something after buying the team that we didn't tell you or show you, you can come back to us for money. You can get a reduction in your purchase price if it's a negative issue or if it's something that you just didn't expect. When you are negotiating representations and warranties, you actually negotiate a cap on your liability. So what we did, let's say with Cheater, we would say, yeah, we'll rep and warranty that everything we said is right, but just in case we forgot to tell you that maybe the owner signed a player to a long-term deal that we didn't know about and it's in the drawer, the maximum you can come back to us for is $5 million. So there's a cap that you negotiate. And when you're selling a team, you get to really decide what the cap is because you've got all the leverage. 
And in any negotiation, when you have the leverage, you're going to be the winner. So I don't see the Angels doing anything with Otani whatsoever. I also don't see, from where I sit, any new owner coming in and saying, all right, I'm going to make a decision on Otani right now because there's too many other fish to fry with the Anaheim Angels. There's too many issues. Remember, they've got to clean up their stadium deal. They've got to figure out, are they going to renovate? Are they going to change? Are they going to try to get closer to L.A.? Are they going to get further away from L.A.? So there's a lot of other issues that are going to happen. As far as what it means inside baseball, it's pretty good, right? That Artie Moreno is not a Rob Manford disciple, not a fan of Rob Manford, not a guaranteed yes vote when Rob wants to put things through. I can promise you that the next owner of the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim will be exactly who Rob wants it to be and will be supportive of the initiatives that Rob wants to do. So this is a huge moment right now inside baseball. All of the talk that other owners are celebrating, or maybe the Dodgers are upset because now the new owner is going to be like Steve Cohn and going to raise the payroll from 180 to 270 or something like that. Owners do not think of it that way. They want to get the biggest price possible from someone who has not been to jail, is not going to jail, and doesn't support Trump. No, the third part I'm just kidding about. Formal process. Maybe they, Coca, they wear tuxedos. That's what makes it a formal process. In other news, Walker Ferris Bueller got Tommy John for the second time. I want to tell you a story about what that means. He's a pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers who's been out since June 10th. He's actually, sorry, I hit the microphone with my lips. Coca, did you hear that? I don't know if you can hear that. If you can, we can just edit that out. Okay. Four, six, nine. Walker Bueller is the pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers. He has been out since June 10th with what they call the flexor strain. Yeah, okay, that means you're getting Tommy John. But uh uh-oh, did it again. Uh Uh-oh, I did it again. Is that Britney Spears? I don't know why I'm doing that. Maybe I'm rocking. I don't know. If you're listening to this, then you have no idea what I even look like. Yeah, I'm representing some MPDS stuff here. If I'm doing Levitard's show, I want to make sure that people are aware that I'm loyal to Coca and MPDS. That just because you're off the dinghy for two days does not mean you are taking up permanent residence on the ship. So Walker Bueller got Tommy John out of the draft, missed some minor league time, and now he's getting it again. Here's the problem when you have Tommy John a second time. Each time you have it, there is a smaller likelihood that you are able to return to the pitcher you were. Luckily, the Dodgers did not sign Walker Buehler to a long-term contract. This will have an impact on his career earnings. This will have an impact on his career performance. And it reminds me of one of the best pitchers we ever had. If you remember the guy through the first pitch in Marlins Park, he was a tank named Josh Johnson. We drafted him. I don't remember what year we drafted him, but I think he made his debut Coca in 2006 after we traded everyone away and had that rotation of Scott Olson and Ricky Nolasco and Josh Johnson and Dontrell Willis and Annabelle Sanchez, maybe. I think that was our rotation. Josh Johnson had this power sinker. He was a pitcher who we assumed would not just get a long-term deal, but we assumed would go down as the best pitcher in Marlins history. With all due respect to Beckett and to everyone else, to Leiter, to every other great pitcher, to Willis, to, to well, that time we had not seen Jose yet, but Josh Johnson got hurt, and then he got hurt, and then he got hurt. Back to back to back Tommy Johns, and that was it. And now he, we actually signed him to Coke, I think we did sign him to some sort of contract that covered a few free agent years because he got a bit of guaranteed money. And then we traded him after 2012 to the Blue Jays. He was the one in the trade where the Blue Jays rejected him the way we rejected Henderson Alvarez. But that big trade that we did in 2012 had already gone public. So we called up at that time. Uh, it was the GM of the Braves right now. I believe the guy we dealt with was Alex Anthopoulos. And we just said, listen, our guys hurt. Yeah, we know. Your guys hurt. Yeah, we know. So let's just keep doing the trade and we'll see what happens. Oh, we did in 2010. We gave him, oh, come on. 
David, get the cobwebs out. We gave him in 2010 a four-year deal for $39 million, and people said that we did that because the union had filed a grievance against the Marlins saying, raise your payroll. You're not spending enough on revenue sharing. We said, we'll show you. We'll sign Josh Johnson. <laughs> it's so ridiculous that it makes me laugh. So we signed him to four years, $39 million. You're welcome, Josh. So here's the thing about Tommy John that I wanted to talk about, if you don't mind, for one quick moment. I feel for Walker Bueller. I want to make sure that you're very clear where I stand in terms of my sympathy level. It absolutely stinks when you feel a certain soreness because you're aware, right? You can feel that your arm's not right. Pitchers know, and they know quickly. And what you hope is that it's soreness that can resolve itself. You hope that there's no implication of the ligament. But you, when you go for an MRI, it's mostly clear when there's ligament damage. But then sometimes when it's not, you have to actually have surgery. And then the doctor goes in and looks. And when they're in there, they say, oh, it's torn. We're going to do Tommy John. And the situation where that happens, the team is told, the player is told, the agent's told, and we've given permission to the doctor, the player's given permission to the doctor, hey, whatever's in there, when you open it up, you gotta fix it. So it's not like they open up Walker Bueller's elbow, they see that he needs Tommy John, they close it up, they take him off the anesthetic, and they call up Andrew Freeman and say, hey, he needs Tommy John, what do you wanna do? Or they wake him up and say, Walker, what are your thoughts on this? No, you take care of that way in advance before your count that back from 100, and that's sort of how that goes. So I feel for Walker Bueller. It is a major loss for the Dodgers going forward, but at the end of the day, the Dodgers are quite well equipped to deal with it. They will get more pitchers, more starters, more players, but Walker Bueller's future has now changed. He will not be an ace of his staff again he will not be a long-term pitcher. Two Tommy Johns does not a career make. A study came out about Tommy Johns two days ago about Tommy John's surgery that fascinated me, and I wanted to mention it to all of you parents out there. And even if you're not, if you've been to a Little League game and you see pitchers as kids, if you're watching the Little League World Series and they're ripping off breaking balls, we have tried to explain there are two sets of sort of, there are two schools of thought. One school of thought is the old school of thought, which is the reason why pitchers are getting hurt right now is that they're being babied when they're young. You've got to let pitchers throw. You throw plenty of pitches, don't give them a pitch count, but throw fastballs. No breaking balls until they're at least a teenager. And even then, only several a game. A breaking ball is when you grab, I don't have a ball with me, or, or one that I can grab on air. And you, you put your fingers on the seams. Some, some, some pitchers use one seam, some two, some spread it, some bend their fingers. But the general rule is you put two fingers and you whip it down. So see if you can watch this. I'm doing it right now. I'm whipping it down. And when you whip, like take your, take your hand at an angle right, like a 90 degree angle, your your arm, and then whip your elbow down as though you're throwing a ball or a pitch or anything, put anything in your hand. Do you feel when you whip it, the, the tension on your ligament, which I'm showing you, which is right at where the where your arm bends? You can feel it. Now imagine being a major league pitcher who's trying to throw a breaking ball at 90 miles an hour, who's trying to get into a small box, hoping the umpire calls a strike, hoping that a hitter doesn't hit it, and then do it again and again and again. It's like a rubber band. When you stretch a rubber band enough times, eventually it changes colors. Like you can see that it's fading and, and then it sort of becomes elongated and it, it doesn't snap back the way it should. And then boom, the rubber band splits one time when you do it and then you throw it away. That's what a ligament is, the ulnar collateral ligament. And what pitchers do on a breaking ball, it's that feeling of expanding the rubber band until it breaks. Where a fastball, your elbow is actually angled a different way and you're going forward and you don't have, so don't switch your wrist, like put your hand out in front of you 
facing your palm away and then pretend you're throwing a ball straight and just think, just feel your elbow. It's totally different. So you want young pitchers to throw fastballs. You don't want them to throw many breaking balls. So that's just a fact. That's one school of thought. The other school of thought is, hey, we have to have very strict pitch counts. We want to save their arms because we don't want them to get hurt. And these guys could all become major leaguers. Well, that's obviously not going to happen. But a study came out a couple days ago, and it's a study where they were trying to prove, and they did. It's called Eric Cressy Sports Performance. So you can check it out. It's quite interesting. And what he found out is that the harder you throw, the more likely it is you're going to get hurt. Okay, that's obvious, right? When you're throwing a ball 100 miles an hour, it doesn't matter whether it's a fastball or a curveball. That's not natural. Because when I'm telling you to throw a ball forward, it's not as much tension on your elbow. But now pretend that you're trying to throw 100 and what it takes. These are not athletes. Forget the steroided ones. But it's they're, they're men, right? They've got a talent better than we do. But it's still not a natural thing to throw a ball with that velocity. But what they found out is that there is a correlation between high school showcases and Tommy John surgery. A high school showcase is what parents do to their kids whose kids are believed to be college and pro eligible, likely, possible. It's when scouts come from major league teams and they look at high school players and this is all because in major league baseball we are the opposite of the nfl we are the opposite for the most part if not entirely of the nba with a few exceptions we draft kids out of high school so we are looking at kids starting when they're freshmen think about that they're 14 years old 15 years old they're kids and we send in John Lovitz and he's got the cigar in his mouth and he's going to look at the kids and the future of that kid could be decided when he's 15, which is totally ridiculous because A, they're too young to really properly evaluate, but it doesn't matter for us as a major league team, we don't care whether high school pitchers get hurt because we just won't draft them. We'll watch a bunch of high schoolers, and if we think they're going to be good and we see they progress, we could draft them. If they don't progress, we'll look at them as they go to college or if they get drafted by someone else or they just go into water polo. So for us, the players in high school are just commodities. But do you remember when I told you that my desire was to get all drafted players, Tommy John, immediately? just so they could get it over with because all these young players and young pitchers are getting Tommy John on our dime. We're paying for it. Why not get it done with someone else paying for it? Someone else paying for the surgery, someone else paying for the rehab. I don't want to deal with the workers' comp claim. There's now a study out there that shows that the more high school showcases that are done, the higher likelihood it is that a player is going to be hurt and have Tommy John. Why is that? because these high school players go to these showcases and they get pressured by their parents. They get pressured by their coaches. They get pressured by agents. Oh my God, yes, agents representing high schoolers? Hmm, that seems totally out of bounds, not proper. Yeah, you're right, that never happens. <laughs> not. So they get pressured to perform. So they're not fully warmed up. They're not fully, their arm is not ready to do what they ask their arm to do. It has not been trained to do what these showcases ask their arms to do. And then they get hurt. How is this ever going to change? The reason why it's never going to change is that until baseball says you can no longer draft high school players, we have a job to do. We have to try to identify 15 year olds and 17 year olds and try to figure out if they're ever going to be helpful to us at the big league level. Therefore, we are going to abuse them. And I'm talking about their arms. And we are making sure that high school coaches and 
not just former coaches of high school teams, but we also talk to those people who are the side coaches, because all these high school players and grade school players, all these parents hire, oh, he's got his own pitching coach, his own hitting coach. They know exactly what they need to get out of these kids for those kids to have a chance to be drafted and be successful, and their business depends on it. So there's not one level of person from high school coach formal to high school coach informal to scout all the way up to GM and president. Not one person is looking out for the health of your child. Guess what? That means you have to. But are you going to when there could be money at stake? Hmm. All right, when we come back, we are going to review a movie about Jane Goodall. And then we're going to talk about Kevin Durant. He's back, baby. Everything's perfect with the Nets. They are kumbaya, my lord. They held hands. They met in L.A. It's brilliant. Everything's perfect. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. This is David Sampson. Thank you. You rated. You reviewed. You followed. You told your friends about Nothing Personal. We appreciate it. Watch a movie every day. I went to the mountains of Uganda and saw gorillas during the uh, trip to Africa that I took in August. And there's three places where you can see silverback gorillas. And that's it. You can see them in Rwanda, you can see them in Uganda, and you can see them in the DNC. Congo, you may call it. Jane Goodall is a woman who did a lot of work with chimpanzees, did a lot of work with primates, and is basically the woman who found a way to explain to you evolution not from Adam's rib. In addition, she spent her entire life trying to educate people about animals and about the way animals interact with human beings, about not just how close these animals are, how smart they are, but how important they are to this world. She devoted her life to helping kids, to helping animals. If you have not heard of her, they made a documentary called Jane Goodall, The Hope. And it's very short. I wanna say it was 80 minutes or 70 minutes or 69 minutes, whatever it was. And there are some people, there are some people in this world who are just good people through and through. Jane Goodall is one of them. If you have a chance to check it out, please do. Jane Goodall, The Hope. It's a documentary. I have no idea, no idea what channel. Okay, I got to spend time on Durant because this is way too good. It's just way too good. All right, Kevin Durant is the guy who asked for a trade. Do you remember that? He's the net player, and he went to the Warriors, won a championship, and then he was on the nets, and then they wanted Harden, so they got Harden. Then they wanted Kyrie, they got Kyrie. They had the big three. The big three never played together. Then Kevin Durant said, you know what? I'm out of here, and if you don't trade me, then fire our coach and GM. Go back to one of our previous shows because we had fun with that. This was the ultimate in player entitlement, and the Nets owner, Joe Sy, and it's always Joe and his wife, they said, we're only gonna make a trade if it's the right trade. We're gonna wait. We're not just trading him because we're gonna trade him, right? No, just because he asked for it, forget it. Word came out yesterday that Kevin Durant was in LA, wait for it. He was in LA with his agent and he met with Steve Nash and the general manager, Sean Marks, the two guys who he wanted canned, who he said to the owner, if you don't can them, trade me. Kevin Durant met with them and the owner and the owner's wife, Clara. The number of times that I met with Jeffrey and Jeffrey's wife and a player and a player agent, wait for it. Hold on. Let me come up with the number. All right. I got it. Zero. The number of times that I met with Jeffrey and our GM and our manager with a player who is unhappy, hold on, l let me think, let me think. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. Zero. If a player demanded to be traded, I would say, good luck, we'll do whatever we want with you, you're under contract. 
You want to play well, play well. You don't want to play well, don't play well. It's your own life. Oh, but you have a guaranteed contract. Hey, there's a provision that you have to do your best in every guaranteed contract. Doesn't mean you have to hit 300, but you certainly can't take it. So not only did the owner and the GM and the coach agree to meet with Kevin Durant, but after the meeting, they actually released a statement about the results of that meeting because there's so much talk, so much talk for whatever reason about the Kevin Durant. Is he gonna be traded? Is he not gonna be traded? Should he be traded? That the Nets felt the need, and I have no idea why they would feel this need, but they felt the need to tell us what happened. Steve Nash and I, together with Joe Sy and Claire Sy, met with Kevin Durant and Rich Kleiman in Los Angeles yesterday. Okay, again, it doesn't matter where you meet. When you do a statement about something that happens, no one cares where the meeting was. And here's what happened. We have agreed to move forward with our partnership. I'm sorry, tell me about the partnership. I'm not familiar with a partnership where one side pays the other hundreds of millions of dollars. Do you mean we've agreed to move forward with our employee? Do you mean we've agreed to move forward with our player? Do we mean that the player has rescinded his trade demand, which had about as much weight as a feather falling off the Empire State Building? Is that what we mean? Partnership? Since when do we, as a front office, have to have a partnership with a player? And this is not me being anti-player, it's me asking a very simple question. What is the reason for that? I can't think of one, but okay. We've agreed to move forward the partnership. Why not say that Kevin Durant dropped his trade demand? Why not say even better, we met with Kevin Durant and reiterated, I, the owner, reiterated that we are not firing Steve Nash or Sean Marks, period. And by the way, KD, we're not trading you either, period. That was our meeting. And we did it by Zoom. I didn't schlep to LA. I wonder why the meeting was in LA. Hmm, because how many people live in LA in that meeting? But then the statement continued. We are focusing on basketball. Well, that's good. I'd hate to focus on baseball. One collective goal in mind. What do you think the collective goal would be for Kevin Durant over the next four years of his deal? Build a lasting franchise. I don't even understand what that means. It's what we always say. I used to say stuff like this too. We are building, all, all the GMs say this when they're fired and then rehired or at the opening press conference when a new manager comes. We wanna build a team that's competitive year in and year out. We wanna build a winning tradition. We wanna be competitive. Year after year, time after time. It's so ridiculous. That's their collective goal. Build a lasting franchise. You think Kevin Durant gives a flying rat's ass about whether or not the franchise lasts other than four more years? The minute he gets his last dollar from the Nets, the Nets could disappear off the universe. They could fall off the earth and he wouldn't care. And they wanna bring a championship to Brooklyn. Oh good, that's very nice. That's very, very nice. But on the press release, there's the logo for the Brooklyn Nets and the logo for the boardroom. The boardroom is the company owned by Kevin Durant. It's like his own company. Can you imagine when Coke and I were preparing for the show today? And Coke said, can you imagine if the Lakers sign LeBron James to a 97 million two-year deal extension, which they just signed him to, and they do a press release and they had that sort of crown. Isn't LeBron the crown logo for his company, Coca? Whatever crown it is, I think it's that crown. The Nets agreed to put boardroom on the press release as a way of showing their partnership. Joe, you are doing so well so well with taking away the player empowerment. You were doing so well with taking your franchise back. And you agreed to put the logo on the release? You wimp. Can you imagine a player saying, hey, we, we need to go public with this meeting right now, if you don't mind. 
and we want to say how good everything is. is. Is that cool? And then we're going to not just talk to the media. We're going to do a statement. I'd like, I'd like to see the statement. And and oh, by the way, I want approval over what the statement says. And I'd like my company logo on the statement. Get out of here. Not only are you not seen the statement, but your logo is not going to be anywhere near the statement. Now, there are times that I've given in to certain things. Believe me, I have. When Scott Boris sits at the table of a press conference announcing the signing of a player, that is me giving in. It sickens me to this day to even think of that. Kevin Durant, a partnership with the Nets. Does this mean he's not going to be traded? Let's pretend a team calls up right now, today, and says, all right, I'm going to give you the Juan Soto Herschel Walker deal. And I'm talking about when Herschel Walker was not a Senate candidate because right now you wouldn't trade like one potato for him as a Senate candidate. But when he was a football player, if there's a deal that presents itself, like let's say the Celtics call up today and say, all right, we've decided we really want to rant on the team. We've got some cap space that's going to open up, but we're going to give you and pretend it works with the cap. Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown and three picks and Marcus Smart and maybe Derek White. Guess what happens? Kevin Durant is traded so fast your head would spin. Spin, I say. So don't believe the fact that, oh, it's a formal process of building a partnership with one goal of a lasting franchise. I hope you bet on our picks of the day yesterday. We had the Astros over the Twins and the Dodgers over the Brewers. Tony Gonsolin again pitched well. He didn't go deep into the game, but they crushed the Brewers 10 to one. And Justin Verlander pitched a no hitter. How come we didn't lead with it? Well, they took him out in the sixth inning, but it was a no hitter when they took him out. The Astros beat the Twins. We're now 89 and 73. If you have not watched Justin Verlander pitch this year, you need to. He almost guaranteed, well, it's only August, so I can't say he guaranteed it, but pretty damn close, guaranteed himself the Cy Young. Another amazing performance. I'm glad we didn't take DeGrom over the Yankees yesterday. I'm glad for several reasons, because DeGrom didn't pitch, and the Yankees swept the Subway Series two games to zero. Aaron Judge hit his 48th homer. There's a lot of excitement now. Baseball has Pujols, they have Aaron Judge, a lot of things to distract you from the fact that 2,500 people watched the Marlins two days ago, or 8,000 people watched the Rays. I can't believe no one lies about attendance anymore. Totally ridiculous. The Rays have a team, they're not as good as they were last year, at least the record doesn't show it, but they could still make the World Series. They still have a great rotation. They've got McClanahan going, and they're going against the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Let's talk about that. The impact of the clubhouse when your team is for sale. There's a lot of buzz. When Jeffrey had decided to sell the Marlins, the clubhouse knew, right? Stanton was aware, Yelich was aware. Everyone was very aware of what was happening. And they would ask me, you know, what does it mean? Are you going to stay? When's it going to happen? Because they're all worried about their own contracts. Who's going to negotiate an extension for them? Who can give them a guaranteed contract? It's not like they want to get rid of me or rid of Jeffrey. It's actually different. They're just trying. They want stability. It's like when your company is sold, right? When you're working for a company and all of a sudden there's a formal process to either merge or acquire or something else, right? You want to know, like, who's coming in? Are they going to keep us? Are they not going to keep us? Where's their home office? Are they going to move us? That's the equivalent of a player wondering whether he's going to get traded. Players with no trade clauses actually don't really care because they control their own destiny. So are the Angels distracted by everything that's going on? Yeah, they really are. They're distracted by what's going on with Otani. They're distracted by what's going on with Artie Moreno. They're distracted by the fact that Joe Madden got fired. They're distracted by the fact that Phil Nevin has not been able to perform for them. So there are myriad distractions going on. But that's not why I'm choosing the Rays over the Angels. I'm choosing the Rays over the Angels because McClanahan is in the running for Cy Young. He's going to lose to Verlander, but he's going to finish on the podium for sure. So pick of the day, Rays over McClanahan. Well, we did not get to Tatis, but I think I'm going to work him in at some point, maybe even today on the Levitard Show, or maybe tomorrow on Nothing Personal. But Tatis met the media. That's pretty exciting. 
So I'd like to formally end the show with the process. First, I'm going to hit the cough button. And then I'm going to hire somebody, pay them millions of dollars so they can tell me to say it's just business. This is nothing personal.